Hi, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the Performing Arts Series, which is put on by the Kennedy Center and Prince William Sound. I'm Amelia Rudolph. I'm the artistic director of Project Bandaloop, which you were just seeing a little bit of on the screen there. Uh, Project Bandaloop is a dance company. We've been around since 1991, about 12 years. And there are seven dancers, including myself, we also have two riggers and a company manager, and we tour around and do performances all over the country and sometimes all over the world. Uh, what's different about Project Bandaloop than other dance companies is that we combine rock climbing and dance. We also combine the technology, like the ropes and rigging from climbing with the dance. So that enables us to dance off the ground, meaning in the air, and on, for example, when I look at that wall, that looks like a dance floor to me, right? That's probably more what you're used to seeing as a dance floor. But for me, if I look at a building, I see a dance floor. If I look at a cliff, I see a dance floor. So for me, dance happens in the air and on the ground and on buildings all over the place. Uh, let's see, what else can I tell you about Project Bandaloop? Hmm. Actually, you know what? I'm not going to tell you anything more right now. I'm going to show you stuff. But before we do that, I'm going to ask a question about what, what is dance? What makes movement into dance? When you talk about dance, what makes it different from regular movement? Is it that you're moving to music? Is it that it's special, it has special formal meaning or it's specially stylized? Is that what makes it dance? Is it that it's about an emotion? Let's say you're moving about being happy or sad. What makes something dance? I think dance is everywhere. I think that Michael Jordan dances when he plays basketball. I think that Venus Williams and Mia Hamm dance when they play tennis or soccer. When I see a crowd on the street walking through one another, like that, I see dance. To me, that is dance. See you guys sitting still, you look like you could be one big dance, just you're not dancing yet. But to me, dance is everywhere. Um, you know, but I'm a dancer, I'm a choreographer, so in a way, I see dance maybe where other people may not see dance. So does anybody know what the word choreographer means? Go ahead and stand up. I'll say, I'll repeat what you say. What does the word choreographer mean? She says, thank you. A, a choreographer is someone who makes up dance moves and teaches it to people. That is true. A choreographer makes dances. They plan the movements together. Um, so that they coordinate or supervise either an event or a dance. You'll see that my dance company has snuck on behind me on stage. And I want to show that, for example, some people thinks, think that dance movements are complicated and tricky ballet steps, something like you see Suzanne doing right now. This might be what you think dance looks like because it's ballet. That's true. That is dance. Dance can also be, for example, what they're doing now. Something so simple as walking in circles with intention or meaning in a way that they, it gives the movement a context. Thanks, guys. So basically, if you can do movement with rhythm or intention, or you place it in a particular place, it can become dance. Anything can become dance. So I actually uh, would like you guys to try to make a dance for me. Not right now, but tomorrow morning when you're, you get up and you're brushing your teeth tomorrow morning, instead, I want you to think of me. Oh, Amelia said, think of me. Okay, why was I supposed to do that? Because when you're brushing your teeth tomorrow morning, I want you to see if you can make a dance out of brushing your teeth. How would you do that? 
I want you to think about that. Tomorrow morning, there you are brushing your teeth. Can you add some humor to your brushing of teeth? Can you walk around the bathroom in a circle while you're brushing your teeth? Do a few little heel clicks. You know, what does it take to turn brushing your teeth into a dance? When I was your age, or you know, there's a bunch of different ages in here, but I started dancing when I was younger than you. When I was six years old, I started dancing. Um, I studied ballet when I was really little. I actually studied Indian classical dance in India when I was seven years old, because I got to live there. And then I started doing gymnastics. I did gymnastics from about third grade through 11th grade in high school. And I loved gymnastics because I loved being off the ground and turning upside down and flying through the air and that feeling of suspension at the top of a flip or the feeling of strength in my body, that I could do things physically, and I could do pull-ups, and it also gave me confidence to be able to feel, feel that I could do whatever I wanted. But particularly, the feeling of being off the ground inspired me. About 12 years ago, in Yosemite, I started rock climbing. How many people here have ever tried rock climbing? Raise your hand. Okay, that's almost everybody. Wow, thanks. So that's different. When I started rock climbing, people, it just wasn't quite such a normal thing to do because there weren't so many indoor climbing gyms. But in any case, I loved it. I went to the mountains in Yosemite and I climbed a cliff and I loved it. In Yosemite, you see cliffs like this one on the slide or on your screen right now. Beautiful granite cliffs and big blue skies and puffy clouds. It's absolutely beautiful and inspiring. Next slide. And um, there are big old cliffs in Yosemite. This is me climbing on El Capitan maybe four or five years ago on a route that's about 1,800 feet tall. It takes almost all day to climb this climb. It's a little different than climbing in a rock climbing gym, which I also do that, and I like doing that a lot. Next slide. This particular climb is really different than climbing in a climbing gym. This is a bunch of us camped together on, on uh, or clumped together really, on a route called the Shield on El Capitan in Yosemite Park, in California. And the ground in this picture, you see way down to the right of the picture, you can see the nose of El Capitan. That's 2,000 feet below us at that moment in the climb. Um, a group of six of us climbed for six days and five nights to make a piece called Peregrine Dreams on El Capitan. Last thing I'm going to say about climbing, besides the strength and how fun it is, one thing that's amazing about climbing is that it helps you get mental strength. In a situation where you're scared, you have to learn to calm down and, and improvise and find your way out of that situation. In any case, so what does this have to do with the dance company? One day I thought, what can I do with my climbing that can make my dance more interesting? What can I do? How does my dance inform my climbing? How can I bring these two things together? How can I use the ropes and rigging from climbing to be able to dance in the air and on the walls? How could that possibly be? So a climbing gym opened in my neighborhood, a fellow named Peter Mayfield, who's uh, was uh, a great influence for the whole country in building climbing gyms, opened a gym called City Rock. And a bunch of us got together and we said, can we experiment in your gym and dance on your walls? And he said, absolutely. In fact, I think he's here today. Um, he's, he danced with us and read with us for years and still does. But in any case, by experimenting in the gym and on the cliffs, we made a new form of dance, which I call vertical dance. Um, there are other people who do similar things to us, but you'll see in this film some of the things that we do. Enjoy. No, this is not a special effect. These people really are dancing 2,500 feet over Yosemite National Park. They are members of Project Vandaloop, a troupe dedicated to expanding the boundaries of dance, to defying principles of gravity, to challenging perceptions of space. Their founder and guiding spirit is 37-year-old Amelia Rudolph, a longtime modern dancer and choreographer 
who took up mountain climbing about 12 years ago. When did it sort of go bingo, I can put these two together for you? It evolved. It wasn't, a, I don't think it was a single moment. It was um, the experience of using my dance skills in climbing and realizing it improved my climbing. And also then to be out in nature and be having the inspiration of a natural place. The two just started to grow towards each other and blend into each other. Soon she was recruiting near her home in the San Francisco Bay Area. She went after dancers who could climb and climbers who could dance. The name Bandaloop came from a fictitious tribe in the Tom Robbins novel Jitterbug Perfume, a tribe that does a dance of longevity. I like the sound of it. I also like the idea that, you know, there's sort of a magical elixir of activity that could somehow extend your vitality. And guess what? <laughs> there's 40-year-old dancers in the company. Both Kimmy Ward and Heather Bear are 40. Teenagers need not apply. At 25, Mark Stuver is the youngest member of the company. Why is the youngest person in this troupe a 25-year-old rather than a 17-year-old, do you think? There's a lot of gravity to what we do emotionally, even though it's this physical thing. We're really in it, and, and we're lending it meaning as it's happening. Nowhere is that need for maturity more obvious than in Yosemite. It's a three-mile hike up to the staging area, a jagged cliff with Yosemite Falls as a backdrop. The dancers travel with a team of riggers. They triple test every rope, every wire, every bolt. And then the dancers triple check everything too. I think people are going to ask, have they ever had a serious accident? Have you? We've not had a serious accident. I do think about it. And I think that anybody who thinks, oh, what a great idea. I think I'll do that with my dance company, should call me. And, and, I, and I have had people call me, hey, I love what you're doing. I'd like to do it too, you know. First thing I say is, and are you ready for somebody to die? And that just wakes them right up. Like, they don't even, like, that doesn't even occur to them. I never forget that, that gra you know, gravity doesn't take a lunch break. In addition to dancing off mountaintops, Bandaloop also tests gravity by dangling from public buildings, like the Space Needle in Seattle. And believe it or not, Rudolph insists that her delight in this comes not from the sense of risk, but from the knowledge that she is exploring the relationship of gravity to movement. You love it for the dance. I love it for the dance. I love it for the recreation of gravity. I love it for the redefinition of what a dance floor is. I love it for the redefinition of architecture, for the redefinition or re to see performance in a different way. It was Mandaloop's different take on the world that brought the funding for this work in Yosemite. So a lot of what you just saw was outside. When I choreograph in the theater, I like to work on the ground and in the air. In the next piece we're about, we are about to do for you, um, we will be, you'll see, uh, one dancer starts in the air and one dancer is on the ground. And then they, and their dance, their duet happens that way. And it's a little sort of about caring for one another. Then we move on to the ground into a group section that travels. It's sort of about traveling and hiking and falling down and getting back up. And then it ends, we leave one dancer on stage by himself for a solo. Um, so go ahead and enjoy.
I have another question. Anybody out there know what I might mean when I say site-specific dance? It's a tricky one. It's okay if you don't. Okay, good, I can tell you what I, oh, there's a two hands. Okay, uh, let's see, person back behind there, I saw a hand, no? Okay, then I'm gonna pick you down in front who had your hand, yeah. Say it louder. <laughs> Only looking at one kind of dancing, not all dancing, put it together. Okay, so that's not what I mean by it. <laughs> what I mean by site-specific dance is dance that's made for a particular place. So you saw on the film, we were on the Space Needle. We made a dance that fit, which was really tricky actually, to make a dance that fit on the Space Needle. You could make a dance in a cave that fit inside the cave and related to the cave, the feeling of cave. Or make a dance on a beach that relates to the feeling of being on a beach and the structures and the sort of the geography of the space. I'll show you a video now of uh, one of the site-specific pieces that we did, which is actually in Houston. And we're dancing with the orchestra below us, and we're dancing on a huge skyscraper. So see, I can float through the air like that. Look, and then you can put, a, put the whole company in a huge diagonal across the skyscraper. We had so much rope, we came out of the 23rd story of that building. 
and it enabled us to do really grand gestures across the whole scope of the building and jump as a group off the building. Also, we had a lot of uh, distance from ourselves to the anchor, which I'll talk about in a moment. So we were able to jump and move really slowly like that so that we looked a little bit like we were on the moon or in soup or something because we moved so slowly because the building was so tall. So that's an example of site-specific work in an urban place. And one thing I like about dancing on a building in an urban place is that often people come to see that dance or walk by that dance who would not normally go to see dance. So you get to have new audiences come to the dance. Like some of you might just be walking down the street one day and you'll look, look up on the building and people be dancing and you'll say, hey, I'll bet that's Amelia and her dance company, Project Bandaloop. I wasn't expecting to see them there. I like that about site-specific urban dance. I'm going to show you a little film now about showing some site-specific dance in nature. Um, in this film, which I actually think you saw a little bit of it earlier, this piece we're doing, we're in Yosemite. You see the Yosemite Falls behind us. We have, you can't quite see a structure called Lost Era Spires to the other side, but see how much space is around us? That totally informs how we dance and how we feel about the dance, and in a way, how the choreography is built relates to the environment that we're in. So we were able to do these kind of big pendulums like that, like that, and jump into the air in a particular way on that cliff because of the nature of the cliff. We also chose costume colors, which you can kind of tell in the video that, relate, that, that matched the rock and the colors that we were dancing on. In that situation right there, that's me spinning in space about 2,000 feet off the ground. It was so scary, but it was really fun too. So site-specific work, now you know. Site-specific dance or site-specific work is about making dance in a particular place that relates to that place. Okay, I'm gonna sh give you a few words to think about. Let's see, does, uh, I won't even ask you the first one, I'm just gonna tell you the first one. The first word I'm gonna talk about is the word pendulum. You heard this word before, pendulum, right? A pendulum is when a, in our situation, it's when a dancer, but it could be any weight, is hanging from a fixed point. Here you see us using pendulum uh, on the screen. We're using pendulum to run back and forth on the building back and forth, so that we're under the influence of gravity, but we're able to harness that. Mark and Suzanne are showing my next word, which um, is suspension. Does anyone know, want to, well, I, actually, I'm just going to keep talking right now. Suspension is when you hang a dancer from above or hang a weight from above so they can move freely. I know it also means being asked not to come to school for a few days, but that's not the suspension I'm talking about. Okay, so now Suzanne is inverting, using inversion, which is another word that relates to what we do a lot. Inversion is turning upside down. It can also mean reversing the arrangement or position of something. And in this situation, thank you so much, Mark and Suzanne, for demonstrating these words for us, or these things, inversion and suspension. The last word I want to talk to you about a little bit, or just mention, is a word is the word loft. For us, it mean, has a very particular meaning. Loft means the amount of time, okay, wait, I'm gonna show you loft and then I'm gonna talk to you about loft. Look at that, that is loft. Ooh, it feels so good too. Loft is the amount of time you spend off of a surface, you push off of a wall and how much hang time you have, kind of, that's your loft. And loft directly relates to the distance from the dancer to the anchor above. So the further you are from your anchor, the more loft you have. So if I'm tied in only 10 feet above my head, I'm gonna do a little teeny jump. But if I'm tied in 200 feet above me, when I jump off the wall, I can actually jump for almost 10 seconds in the air. Imagine if right now I were to jump in the air for 10 seconds, wouldn't that be weird? You know, you can't, you can't do that regularly. But that's what's fun about the kind of dancing that we do. You might be wondering why ropes are coming in over the audience and the lights are going on, but that is because we're gonna do a little demonstration now um, with the students from the Thomas Jefferson, three students from Thomas Jefferson High School. 
and they are going to rappel down for you. Um, I'm going to explain what they're doing. Uh, we've got three of them, and they when I have three dancers, making sure that they're safe. They are wearing regular climbing harnesses, like you might in a climbing gym, or if you went out climbing. Then they're taking what's called a grigri, which is a self-locking belay device, and they're clipping the grigri. They're putting the rope through the grigri, and they're clipping it to their harness with a locking carabiner. A carabiner is basically a snap link that connects two parts of climbing, you know, rope to person, rope to harness, rope to rope, rope to anchor. And um, they're also using the last piece of equipment. You can see Gary in the middle there in the yellow. He's got a, a, on his rope, he has also an, a, <clears throat> an ascender. And an ascender helps you ascend, climb up, the rope, it can slide up the rope, but it can't slide down unless you do something special. It's got little teeth on it that hold the rope. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna sit down into their harnesses and they're gonna set up and put their feet into their, basically we've hung webbing from their ascenders. And one, they're almost ready, I think. And I'm going to ask them to do a few things, demonstrate a few things for you. Okay guys, why don't you start heading up the rope? So they're using the Grigri, which is locking, and the ascender, pushing the ascender up the rope so that they can ascend the, the lines. And you might think it takes a lot of strength. It does take some, but actually they're using the mechanical advantage of their Grigri and the setup that we've given them. You can go ahead and hand your ascenders down to your lovely Bandaloop assistants. They're using the mechanical advantage of their of the equipment to get up the ropes. So now I'm gonna have them do just a few things for you guys. Why don't you show them how to make a ball in the air, which is harder than it looks to stay balanced. And now how about going out to a coma, flat body position, lengthening out using your abs, straightening straight, and tipping those comas for me. This is called a tipping coma in my world. Beautiful. Let's give them a little round of applause for the tipping coma. <laughs> okay. Go ahead and sit up, and how about make a bat for me? We call this one a bat, because it looks like a bat, kind of, I think. Beautiful. And I wanted to sit up and roll to one side. So I want to show you, so you can move in the harness fairly freely, and let's see, roll all the way to the other side. Look at that, okay, and why don't you just go ahead and improvise. Show us a little movement of your own choosing. Yeah, you can play, you can dance, you can goof around, you can do sit-ups. <laughs> Great, you guys, why don't you slowly and carefully and smoothly rappel down to the ground. And let's have a big round of applause for our helpers. That's Megan Knoll, Gary Schombach, and Jason Pops. They're all from the Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology. Um, I'd really like to thank them for performing with us and to thank their teacher, Betty Stegall, who helped us arrange that. So one thing I just, I really want to emphasize when you see us dancing on cliffs or on buildings or even those guys dancing right over the audience there, the first thing on my mind, can anyone guess what the first thing on my mind is? Yeah, what do you think it is? Take precaution. Take, yay, gold star. Take precaution. Safety is the first thing on my mind. And I'll tell you just a couple things that I think about when I think about safety. The first thing I think about pretty much is that when you're making your systems to say, stay safe, you better account for the fact that something probably is gonna go wrong. Because if you assume that everything's gonna go right, you probably won't, won't be ready if something goes wrong. So the main thing when you're thinking about how to be safe is take a moment and think, you know, how, how could something go wrong? And that will really help you create systems and ways to be as safe as you can be. The other thing that's really important to me is to work with people who have a lot of experience. Backstage for our shows here in, uh, in uh, 
At the Kennedy Center, we had Steve Schneider, who's been rigging and climbing for over 30 years. Thomas Cavanaugh has over 10 years of experience of rigging in the theater and outdoors and nature with us. And we spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, they spent a lot of time thinking about what could go wrong, how things change, and how to be as safe as they can be. Because everybody makes mistakes, I think. Human error is my biggest, you know, the trickiest thing. You're gonna see the dancers coming out on stage for our last dance that we're going to do for you live on stage here today. Um, they're setting up and they're demonstrating the last thing about safety I'm gonna talk about, which is being redundant. Anybody know what the word redundant means? Ooh, I saw that hand go up. To repeat yourself, that's actually totally good definition. It also, basically, she said it to repeat yourself. So, <laughs> To be redundant is to do it more than once, whatever it is you're doing. So for example, when we're doing, we're being redundant making an anchor, we put three points that lead to one point in case one of them fails, you have two left. Redundancy in our checking system, what happens is the dancer checks herself or himself, then they check their partner, and then often in situations we have the rigger come through and do a third check. And we've actually caught mistakes on the final check sometimes. So it's really important when you're being safe, don't do it once, don't check once, check twice or three times. Uh, let's see, so I guess they're ready and I am gonna stop talking about safety and let you enjoy uh, some of this dance, which is a piece from Crossing, which stories of gravity and transformation that we just did at the Kennedy Center based on a counterbalance set.
We'll get those dancers down. Um, I'd like to thank, uh, well actually, I would like to invite our viewing audience to start calling in now with questions. The phone number to call in is 1-800-672-0067. That's 672-0067. You can also email us at pwinfo at aol.com. pwinfo at aol.com. Let us hear from you, please. And I'd like to uh, invite the company out on stage to introduce yourself. I think that your audience is eager to meet you. So come on out. How about a round of applause for the company? So why don't we just start at this end with Kimmy. Go ahead and introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Kimmy Ward. Um, I originally came from Maryland, but I've been living in California for a long time, particularly in Yosemite. Um, I've been dancing with Project Bandaloop for about 11 years. I started dancing maybe 28 years ago, um, studying modern dance. Um, before I even started dancing, I was um, really athletic and played basketball and swam and did all kinds of sports and now I continue on with not only dancing but climbing and mountain biking and rock climbing and skiing but my favorite is dance and that's my primary endeavor. Hi, my name is Heather Baer and I was born and raised in Hollywood, California. I've been dancing with the company since 1990. My background um, when I was primarily your guys' age was I did mostly gymnastics, but then once I went into the latter part of high school and early part of college, I started getting more involved in dancing. I also do a lot of rock climbing in my life, and my other job besides this is I teach kids ages 2 to 14 gymnastics, rock climbing, and dancing. Hi, my name is Malesio Estrella. I grew up about 40 miles north of San Francisco. And when I was young, I was a gymnast. I loved it. I loved to flip. I loved cartwheels, everything. Um, loved to be on my hands. And when I was 16 years old, I stopped doing gymnastics and started dancing. I'm studying most, mostly modern dance. And now I teach gymnastics and I dance with the company. Hi, my name is Rachel Lincoln. And I grew up in Tucson, Arizona. And I started dancing when I was pretty little, doing ballet. But then I started getting more interested in diving. So I was a springboard and platform diver. So I kind of got a sense of orientation in the air with flipping and turning. And then I started studying modern dance again in college and moved to San Francisco and found Project Bandaloop, which kind of combined my two loves. So that was 1999. Hello, my name is Suzanne Gallo. I um, was born in Oakland, California, and I grew up in El Cerrito. I loved to dance as a small child all over the place. <laughs> and my parents introduced me to ballet, and I loved that too. And I went on to have a long career as a professional ballet dancer. Sometime along the way, I had a desire to move in a different way. And shortly after that, I met Amelia Rudolph of Project Bandloop, and took some of that love of ballet, the air, and modern dance, and have been with Bandaloop since. Hi, I'm Mark Stuver, and I'm from Rifle, Colorado. Um, and I grew up playing soccer, snowboarding, and rock climbing there. And then I went to college in New England, where I started studying modern dance. And after a couple of years out of school, I moved to San Francisco. And in 2000, I found Project Bandaloop. They found me, and it was a good match. And been doing it since. Okay, it looks like we have a caller from uh, Yorktown, Virginia. Go ahead, caller. Hi, I'm enjoying the show on television. Great. I wondered if you could tell me if your music is created specifically for each dance or if your dance is interpreted through your music first, which would come first. So I don't know if you heard that. She's asking, did the music come first and we make the dances to the music or vice versa? First thing, I want to credit the musicians, the composers, which are uh, Zachary Caratine and Raymond Granlin. That's all original music that was written for us uh, for this performance. And um, 
I do both. Sometimes one of the pieces which we did not do today, actually, I heard the music and created the dance to the music. The piece you saw that inverted duets, I actually, we sort of made them concurrently and I gave the composers ideas of what I wanted to hear, the sounds of carabiner and equipment and music together. Um, so that piece is sort of a back and forth one. It, it, so I do it in different ways. Okay, so we're gonna go for a question person right here in our audience, go ahead. We perform a lot at our school and we would like to know how you prepare for each performance. How we, why don't I, Rachel, why don't you start with that one? How do you prepare for each performance? Well, we all prepare in different ways, but a lot of us, we definitely warm up really well, and a lot of us do yoga, or we do some kind of qigong or energy work. Um, and we kind of hang out together and get our bodies warm and think about the show, and then we perform. Lots of practice and rehearsal before that. Okay, I'm going for an email question now from Davenport School of the Arts in Florida. The question is, have you changed mentally or physically since performing with Project Bandaloop? Suzanne? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, when I first started with Bandaloop, um, my physical appearance was vastly different from what it is today. Um, this work requires tremendous skill and use of your stomach and we've all developed uh, upper bodies and switching gravity around has allowed me to have a different perspective on space, movement, time. Okay, I'm actually gonna go on, I know that you guys wanna answer that too, but I see we've got a caller from Ailey, Ailey Hastings School in Texas. Go ahead, caller. Um, yes, I want to know how do you get involved in um, the kind of dancing that you do? How do you get involved in the type of dancing that we do? Well, okay, there, are, there is an aerial dance festival every summer in Boulder, Colorado that brings in a lot of different aerial dance companies um, to train people. I know they have bungee workshops and trapeze workshops and that sort of thing. We sometimes, usually maybe on, uh, on tour we do residency work, but that's usually with kids. We do occasionally do workshops in our studio in Oakland. Um, I would go on the web and um, check for, you know, do a search for aerial dance and see what's in your area. Uh, in Texas, I'm sh I actually am trying to think if there's a dance company in Texas that I know of, but go ahead and email me at uh, Project Bandaloop or info at projectbandaloop.org and I'll get back to you and try to help you out. Okay, we're going for a live question here. What advice would you give to students who would like to become professional performers? What advice would you give to students who want to become professional performers? My first thing I would say, and I'm going to pass it to them, is make sure you really, really want to do it because it's a lot of work, but it's super fun. Okay. Yeah, it is a lot of really, really hard work, but if you really love it, just keep doing it. Just keep doing it. Find the opportunities in your school with your family to sing or dance and perform or make up your own dances and just keep doing it. Okay, going for an email question. Um, we have the question says, do the dancers feel fear or do they feel at home in the air? Malesio, the most recent member of Project Band Loop is gonna answer that question. Yeah, it, it is scary. It's, I just started this year. A lot of these people have been doing it for years, like more than I think Mark's been doing it for four years. But I just started this year and I haven't done much of this work. And getting up, especially on the hard cliff faces, it's really scary. It can be really scary to, to, not, to not know exactly um, where things are in space when you're flipping through space. And since I do have gymnastics background, it helped a lot, I think, to... Uh, to know where I am, the aerial awareness, my body. But yeah, I, we do get scared and we think it's healthy mm -hmm. to get scared. I support that, yeah, it's okay. Fear makes you keep safe. Um, I'm gonna go on. We've got a caller from Colorado State University. Go ahead, caller. Hi, um, I was just wondering, you guys, it takes a lot of muscular agility and a bunch of hand-eye coordination for this. What, um, what do you do to hone these 
What do we do to hone the techniques that seem to take uh, coordination and strength and that sort of thing? Why don't, Heather, you want to go for that one? Well, as Rachel was saying before, we all have different styles and um, uh, different ways we warm up. But I, I personally do a lot of Pilates and gyrotonic, and it's helped me a lot just to be more aware of space, of my placement, and um, just has given me a lot more movement awareness. But I think all of us cross train a lot. I think we all do a lot of cardiovascular training as, lot as, as well as a lot of stretch and endurance. Yeah, I'd say across, basically we've got yoga, rock climbing, dance class, which includes modern dance of different kinds, and ballet for some people um, are kind of the main, some I used to run, but now I've, now I've taken to walking fast uphill. Um, okay, so let's go for somebody in the audience there, yeah. I was wondering, what does, um, what does the costume have to do with the dancing? What does the costume have to do with the dancing? That's a great question. We're going to give that to Suzanne, who helped design the costumes. And in fact, we're not wearing our full costume today, so that's part of it. But uh, Yes, as Amelia just said, we're not wearing our full costume today. These costumes were created for our project, Crossing. And um, the other part of the costume that you're not seeing today are sleeveless robes with big slits that allow for a lot of movement, and each robe has an individual motif from a mountain range to moss, flowers, wood grain, water, trees, and branches, and uh, that's maybe more the visual embodiment of the concept of the piece, and that adds a finishing touch, I think. And one thing I would add is that we, you notice we are all wearing different colors. We don't always do that, but in this piece I really wanted to emphasize the individual and then have them all match together, color coordinated it, once they get together as a group. Okay, we are going for an email from Thomas Pullen School for the Creative and Performing Arts. They say, you make the dancing, climbing, look easy. How much training goes into one piece? Okay, I'm going to quickly answer that one. This. We just did two little excerpts from a piece that's actually about an hour, a little over an hour long that we just did at the Kennedy Center. And the piece that we did at the Kennedy Center, the actual choreography for that piece, we started on in uh, pretty much early, late January, early February of this year, and we worked straight through for about three and a half months to make an hour of choreography. Um, but a lot of things go into making a piece. In fact, there are a couple of years of inspiration in music and the fact that we crossed the Sierra to, uh, as part of the inspiration for that piece. So it was years that before we got to the choreography. But the choreography itself, I'd say about three and a half months to make about an hour of choreography. Going for the caller. OK, we're going for a caller from Thurgood Marshall High School in Texas. OK, go ahead, caller. Hello, my name is Andre Dudley. And I perform in talent shows at school, and I always get a little nervous. I always want to know some of y'all get nervous before you perform. So if you heard that, he's, that's great. Congratulations, you're a performer. Good job. Um, yes, he's asking, do we get nervous before performances? And I would add to your question, and how do we handle that? Um, somebody want to answer that one? OK, Suzanne? I won't hog the mic, but uh, I think nervousness, I think everyone feels at one point or another. But um, I read a quote that Yo-Yo Ma, the cellist, said, and basically you, he says basically that he just wants to share what he does. And that kind of puts a whole different spin on performing. So maybe that could help. To share what you do. Um, I'd also just add um, one thing I really recommend is to practice closing your eyes and breathing deeply and slowly. If that doesn't work, jump up and down like that and just shake everything. Uh, uh, uh. I actually do the jump up and down kind. I see people doing it. I do the jump up and down kind because it shakes the nerves down or something. I don't know, but it really helps me. Okay, we're going for a live person here. <laughs> uh oh, everyone's jumping now. Okay, go ahead. What are you trying to show in this program? What are you trying to show in this program? Well, this whole program today, we're really trying to show the range of what we do by showing you the videos from outside on the mountains to the videos of us on buildings to showing us dancing inside here in the theater. So it's kind of about showing you the range of different things that we do. 
Um, choreography on the ground in the theater is much more about acting and in, sort of relating an emotion or relating small gestures between people, whereas if you're on a building or a cliff, it's much more about the grand gesture of what you're doing. Uh, okay, going for the email. Um, from Davenport School of the Arts in Florida, it says, what are your future plans for Project Bandaloop? Okay, let's see, that's a, hard, that's a good question. Some of our future plans are, we're actually, I'm going to China in two weeks, to Macau, China, which you guys can look up on a map, I had to. Um, and Macau, China has an arts festival and they want us to perform on a tall tower there and maybe also on a building, so that's sort of an immediate near future plans, but I really hope to be able to do a big project in uh, nature again in the next year or two, uh, because in fact I find that to be some of the most satisfying work that we do, and I hope to travel internationally, whether it's China or somewhere else, to both dance on a building or on a mountain. Last question maybe, or near? Okay, go ahead. Um, go ahead. How, how do you choose or make your musical selection? How do you choose your musical selection? In this situation, okay, uh, we worked with two composers, and I'm realizing I can't even answer your question, okay, but email me that question and I will talk to you about it because we've run out of time. I'm sorry. Um, I'd like to thank the students in the auditorium for being with us today. And I would especially like to thank the viewing audience from across North America and the country for tuning into the program. If you didn't get a chance to ask a question today, you can contact the performers using the email address that's on your screen right now. Uh, we'd love to hear from you because we'd love to answer your questions. We'd also like to invite you to visit the Kennedy Center website at the address on your screen. There you'll find additional information about the programs at the Kennedy Center that are upcoming, as well as resources for integrating arts into the curriculum at your school. We'd also like to hear from, you, from what you think about the Kennedy Center program for the performing arts, the whole performing arts series. So we're asking you to complete an electronic evaluation form, and you'll see that as on the address on your screen. This will help us to select topics and resources you need to enhance your classroom experience. Please remember to join us at the next Kennedy Center program on Friday, December 5th, which is from 11 to 12 Eastern Time, when the singers and songwriters from the Broadway hit Thoroughly Modern Millie will discuss the world of musical theater. We hope you can join us. Thank you so much for being with us today. And as we end today's program, let's take a look at one final video clip. Bye.